Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to read another picture book biography to celebrate Black History Month. The biography that we're going to read today is of George Moses Horton, who was a poet. This book is written and illustrated by Don Tate, and it's published by Peachtree Books. The end pages have some words from George's poetry. Poet, the remarkable story of George Moses Horton. George loved words. He wanted to learn how to read, but George was enslaved. He and his family lived on a farm in Chatham County, North Carolina, where they were forced to work long hours. There wasn't time for much else. Besides, George knew that his master would not approve of slaves reading. But that didn't stop George from admiring the language that was all around him. Inspirational words read from the Bible, hopeful words delivered in a sermon, lively words sung in songs. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. George was determined to learn how to read. When white children studied their books, he lingered nearby. He listened as they repeated the al letters of the alphabet, and soon George could recite the alphabet himself. A, B, C, T, E, F, G, H, I, J. His mother would have liked to help him, but she couldn't. Instead, she gave George one of her most valuable possessions, a Wesley hymnal, a book of songs. It was George's very first book. He scanned the pages, trying to make out the letters. It was no use, though. He could not read the words. Then George found an old spelling book. It was tattered and some of the pages were missing, but it was enough to get him started. He recognized some of the letters as George thumbed through the pages. At night, when he should have been resting after a long day of work, George studied by firelight. His eyes burned from the smoke. Soon he could make out a few words. Before long, he could understand entire sentences, and over time, George taught himself to read. From that point forward, George not only loved words, he could read and understand them, too. George read verses from the New Testament. He read books, newspaper articles, advertisements, whatever he could find. Most of all, George read poems. He loved be beautiful poetry. From morning until late at night, George tended cattle on his master's farm. While he worked, George composed his own poetry, mingling his words with the tunes of familiar songs. He hadn't learned how to write down his poems yet, so he committed them to memory. Words and rhythms were stored up inside his head. His verses swayed with emotion like the music of Sunday services. They kept him strong as he grew to be a young man. Rise up, my soul, and let us go up to the gospel feast. When George was 17, his master decided to split up his estate. He divided his possessions, land, cattle, wagons, and tools among his family. Slaves were considered to be property too, so George's family was separated. George was given to his master's son. He feared he would never see his mother, brothers, and sisters again. George toiled in the fields in his new master's property. It was disagreeable work, but he found a little relief on Sundays. On that day, George walked eight miles to the village of Chapel Hill, to the campus of the University of North Carolina. There he sold fruit and vegetables grown on his master's farm. He didn't mind the walk, though. George welcomed the opportunity to get away. At first, the college students teased George. To distract himself from their insult, George recited his poetry. Words sweet as fruit, piled high on his cart, sprung from his lips. Every eye grew wide and every mouth fell open at the sound of George's voice uttering beautiful verses. The students were awestruck when they found out that he had composed them himself. News of the slave poet raced through campus like a brisk flowing river. Students swarmed in closer to hear George perform his verses. Some of them decided to help George. They gave him their books. English grammar and dictionaries, history and oratory, classic literature and poetry. George soaked up these new subjects like a sponge. One day, a, George, a student requested a poem for his sweetheart. 
George created a verse for the woman. He dictated the poem to the student who wrote it out neatly. The young lady swooned when she read it. After that, all the other students wanted George's poems, and they were willing to pay for them, too. George composed more than a dozen lots of poems a week, selling them for 25 cents each. Some paid him with fine suits and shoes instead of money. In time, George was dressed as sharply as the students himself. With money, nice clothes, and a newfound status, George felt freer than he ever had in his life. But he was not free. He remained the property of his master. George continued to work on the farm during the week and visited Chapel Hill on the weekends. The story of the slave poet reached the wife of a professor. Caroline Lee Hentz was a professor writer, professional writer and a published poet. George's poems affected her deeply. Some made her smile and others made her want to cry. She sought out George and taught him how to write his poems down on paper with a pen. After so many years of memorizing verses, George could now write them down. Caroline arranged for George's poems to be printed in the Gazette, the newspaper of her hometown, Lancaster, Massachusetts. Now, George was a published poet. His poems protested his enslavement. No other American slave had done that before. Soon, George's work appeared in other newspapers, including Freedom's Journal, the first African-American-owned newspaper in the country. George's heart could barely contain his growing pride. With money from his writing and odd jobs, George was able to pay his master for his time so that he could live in Chapel Hill and work as a poet. It was an illegal arrangement, but the master did not care. George was now a full-time writer, but he was still not a free man. In time, George published The Hope of Liberty, his first book. He wanted to use his earnings to purchase his freedom. When editors at Freedom's Journal learned of his plans, they tried to raise money to help him. Influential people joined the cause. Newspaper men, a college president, a governor. They offered a great deal of money, but George's master refused to sell his valuable slave. George was devastated. When first my bosom glowed with hope, I gazed as from a mountain top. But oh, on some delightful plain, but oh, how transient was the scene. It fled as though it had not been, and all my hopes were in vain. Meanwhile, abolitionists in the North worked to end slavery. They published books, they printed posters and pamphlets, they blanketed the South with their calls for enslaved people to rise up against their master. Slaves who could read told others their message. As a result, more slaves did fight back, and some even killed their masters. Fear ruled the South. New laws were passed in North Carolina. People who printed and distributed anti-slavery materials were penalized. Worse yet, it became illegal to teach a slave to read or write. Now it was too dangerous for George to write poems that protested slavery. But he didn't stop writing altogether. He published a second book, The Poetical Works of George M. Horton, which contained poems about life, love, death, and friendship. In 1861, war broke out between the South and the North, mainly over the issue of slavery. Most students went off to fight to defend the South. With few people left on campus to purchase his poems, George had no money to earn pay for his time away from his master, and he had to return to the farm. Am I sadly cast aside on misfortune's rugged tide? Will the world my pain, will my, the world my pains deride forever? The Civil War raged on for four long years. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln set the nation on a new course by signing the Emancipation Proclamation that soon led to the end of slavery. At the age of 66, George was finally free. Now that he was a free man, George no longer had to remain on the farm. Late that spring, he packed his pens and paper and left. George went west with the Union Army camping, Union Army camping along the way. He wrote poems about his travels, about his family and friends back home, and all the things that he had experienced in his long life. George's love of words had taken him on a great journey. Words made him strong. Words allowed him to dream. Words loosened the chains of bondage long before his last day as a slave. I'll love thee as long as I live, wherever thy condition may be. All else but my life would I give, thou what was this partial to me continues 
here are some of the books that the author, um, books and websites that the author used when he was researching for this book. And the quotations that appeared, um, and the poems are from the poems listed here on this page. There's also an author note talking about why Don Tate wrote and illustrated this book and some acknowledgments and some more of his poetry. So that was the story of Poet, the remarkable story of George Moses Horton. I hope that you enjoyed this book. I wonder if um, you've ever felt like you needed to express yourself and found a way to do that through song or poetry or art or writing or anything else. Art of any kind, writing with words, poetry, painting, drawing, collage, sculpture, music, all of those things are beautiful ways to express the things that you're feeling without being destructive or hurting anything. And they can inspire other people and make them feel what you feel too. I hope you give it a try. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. I hope that you enjoyed today's book about a black, historical black figure for Black History Month. And I hope you'll see to see you again soon. Bye.